All right. Good morning. morning. Now, I hate to say this, but I need to. Um, You may want to be careful about shaking paws. I think we've got a dozen um, that have gotten uh, sick uh, since the Jubilee. And uh, most of it's head cold and that kind of stuff. And so, uh, obviously, we had some folks here during the time of the of the Jubilee, and somebody was probably sick, but we had a great time of fellowship, and we had a wonderful meeting, and that's all great, good, and wonderful, and marvelous, but if you're sick, and you cough, and then shake hands, I know it sounds silly, but that's how you spread it, and you think, well, it's just a cold. Well, you know, just a cold when you're 15 is one thing, when you're 60, it's another, and when you're 80, it's an entirely different deal altogether. And, uh, you know, some of us, you know, we squeal like little kids, little girls. When we wind up getting sick, you know, when you get a little older, you you, uh, tend to to whine about being sick. You know, I'm sick, and, of course, it's your chance to get some attention. But if you're sick, you know, give them the elbow. But um, uh, come to 1 Timothy, if you will, please. Brother Will will be leaving us now. He leaves for boot camp this week, right? Okay, so we'll have a, a moment of prayer for him tonight at the evening service. So you want to make sure that you're here for that. All right, now we uh, got into verse number 20 of First Timothy chapter number 6, and then we're going to jump right over into Second Timothy. Uh, notice what he says. He says, O Timothy, keep uh, that which is committed to thy trust. We talked about the things that the Lord had already given to Timothy as far as the trust is concerned, and then avoiding profane and vain babblings. I went through all those things with you. You say, why? They increase to more ungodliness. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You have to be careful what you listen to. Uh, In the days of Hitler coming around, it was used as what's called propaganda. That goes on in Bible-believing churches. Propaganda, not just about science falsely so called with all this stuff about flat earth and all the other things that go on, which don't amount to a row of pins of anything. Nobody's going to prove uh, uh, perfectly that they believe this or they believe that. It's just something to distract you. I gave you the illustration that if there is such a flat earth, that okay, it's a flat earth. What does that do for your walk in, with Jesus Christ? All it does is create contentions and strivings against what the Bible says is you're not to do that. Those are vain babblings, oppositions of science, falsely so-called. You have a bunch of people who aren't even scientists that are telling you that stuff and telling you about whether or not an asteroid is going to hit the earth and when the earth is going to end and all those kind of things. All that stuff is a waste of air. It's a waste of time. Does it change your relationship with Jesus Christ? And what's the point of discussing it? Well, it's interesting. Okay, then that's fine. But you want to be careful, especially in doctrinal matters. Doctrinal matters are absolute truth. They're not open for discussion. In other words, whenever you get ready to discuss the Bible that says about salvation by the blood atonement, why would you want to discuss with somebody that they believe that salvation is by works? Now, after you have a discussion with them, if they're still stuck where they are and you're stuck where you are, then what have you accomplished? You say, well, iron sharpeneth iron. That's not what he's talking about when it comes to that. That makes you more dogmatic in your position and it makes them more dogmatic in their position. You want to discuss with somebody about tongues. Being for today, you give them what the Bible says about tongues. If they still want to believe in Ashtolashantai, Untai, Abotai, Economy Honda, and so on and so forth, okay, fine. They are entitled to their belief. Do you understand? They can believe that if they want to believe that. But are you going to move the needle by arguing with them all the time? No, it's vain babblings. It's trying to get you off of things. The Bible says in the last days, many give heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's being taught to you by somebody. That's trying to use the church for something God didn't intend for it to be used for. For instance, use it for some social purpose. God didn't intend to use the church for a social purpose. He intended to use the church for a spiritual purpose. This is for your spiritual nourishment. This is to prepare you for the judgment seat of Christ. This is to improve your fellowship with Jesus Christ. Yes, it's to see lost people get saved. No question about that. But you live in a day and time where very few lost people come to church anymore. 
Back in the early days, lost people, everybody came to church. You say, why? That's all they had to do. There wasn't entertainment. You didn't have internet. You didn't have television. You didn't have radio. You had church. So people would come to church. They'd come to big crusades and stuff. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to see people saved in church, but you're supposed to reproduce sheep. You go out and tell people in the world. You pass out a tract to them. You talk to them about Jesus Christ. Tell them about your relationship with Jesus Christ. But you're not to go out there and try to argue with people about things that don't amount to a row of pins. Talk to them about their soul. If you want to argue with them, that's fine, but that's not a place to argue. Is not the church. Adrian Rogers said this. I wrote it down. It is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. Amen. Adrian Rogers continued to say, it is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than a falsehood that comforts and then kills. Uh, Adrian Rogers is uh, very well known. He's dead now. Very well known of uh, Bellevue Baptist Church. He's a very well known Southern Baptist pastor. He took over after, uh, I can see the guy's name right now. He preached uh, Payday Someday. I'll think of his name in a minute. It is better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. Amen. Pretty profound. Yep. Better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with a multitude. Better to ultimately succeed with the truth than to temporarily succeed with a lie. And always remember there's only one gospel. So preacher, what are you trying to say? You don't have to be a jerk to be on the side of truth. One of the things he says to you is speak the truth in what? When you're talking to people, sometimes the reason they're so vehement in their position is because they're ignorant. When I say ignorant, I don't mean mentally deficient. When I say ignorant, I don't mean that they're stupid or that they don't have the ability. No one has ever taught them. Sometimes if you sit down with the individual and have a discussion, it won't take you long to figure out they don't know what you're talking about. They're arguing from the only position they know and that's what they were taught. Things are not always as you perceive those things to be. You never know what position somebody's coming from. You don't know their level of experience. You don't know what's happened in their life. You don't know where they're coming from. If they come from another place over in Europe and they come to the United States of America and you think you know what poverty is and poverty over here is, is cable television and food stamps and all that, and they come from poverty or living in a cardboard box and not having anything but a rat to eat, your idea of poverty and their idea of poverty are two different things. If you judge them based on the American standard of poverty, you You've misjudged the individual. Sometimes in biblical things, ladies and gentlemen, because hopefully, Lord willing, you get fed here, but you also read and study your Bible on your own and you listen to other preachers. When you talk to a Christian, your idea of Christianity and their idea of Christianity are two different things. And if you judge them as if they should know better, you might be really surprised they don't know better. You start talking to people about, for instance, the judgment seat of Christ, which you'll get some of that here this morning. Some people think that's a general judgment. I read several commentators this past weekend studying, and their idea of the judgment seat of Christ is, is that that's the great white throne judgment. These are people that are well known. They're teaching that you never have a judgment. What you do after you're saved doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's getting a white robe and nothing else that matters. You take all the other passages and put them in one bundle and throw them under the great white throne judgment. One of them makes a mistake of making it the judgment of nations. So convinced he is that no Christian is going to stand in any judgment at all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you clearly know about the judgment seat of Christ. If you've been here for more than six weeks and you know that there is a judgment for Christians based on 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans 14. But when you go talk to someone else about that, the next thing you know, there's conflict because there is a misunderstanding. Sometimes it's not because they're jerks. They just don't know. So rather than make it personal and think they don't like you, makes you consider listening to their perception of what it is you're talking about and then maybe use the Bible as the authority to show them your position. And then if you disagree, and a heretic after the first and second admonition, what? 
so knowing that he that is subverted sinning against himself. So that way I've done what I'm supposed to do. Then the Lord gives you the liberty to say you can back off of that now. So notice what he says here. He says uh, to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And then he says grace be with thee. Now we move into the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, if you were to be taking notes, is a book that should be preached along with the book of Colossians. And you say, why? Because it's the latter age or latter days for the church. It's good church age doctrine for the final days before the church is raptured. And when I say raptured, I mean you're taken out before the tribulation. I just heard a sermon on that. Everybody was, you know, this is a great sermon, the great sermon. You've got to hear this sermon. The guy is post-tribulation all the way through. I mean, the whole time he's talking about the wrath is coming and the wrath is going to fall on you and the wrath is going to be this and he's got the whole thing divided out into the first three and a half years. The wrath is going to fall on the church and he's got the church in Israel all discombobulated and messed up and he's using that whole thing against the nation of Israel. He's in Daniel chapter number 9 and he says the 70 weeks determined upon thy people is the church for today and all that stuff because the church has replaced, uh, the church has replaced Israel. You don't replace Israel. Amen. You know that. But if you don't have your Bible down pat and know that, you know what you're doing? You're preparing for the tribulation. The end of that guy's sermon is basically he's telling everybody prepare for the tribulation. Get ready for the banks to collapse. Get ready for the money to go under. Get ready for an economic collapse. Get ready for the calamity to come. Get ready to be invaded by China. He's got the million man army of China coming through and, and raiding the United States and you having to be standing up and the mark of the beast coming in and then he's got Zuckerberg pulled into the thing that he's part of the Antichrist movement to have you marked and get you ready. And if you take this mark and get the grain of rice that you've taken the mark of the beast and there's no hope for you and all that. And I'm thinking, man, I mean, he wasted a lot of airspace to talk to Christians about something that's not going to happen to you. You don't have to worry about the judgment seat, I mean, about the mark of the beast. You say, why? That comes out during the tribulation. We're not going to be here. Amen. Well, preacher, are you really sure about that? Yeah, I'm sure about that. Amen. Well, you know, preacher, a lot, of, a lot of preachers are changing. Just because the Lord's delayed is coming doesn't mean He's not coming. That's right. That's right. That doesn't change. That's still the same way. Well, I think the Lord should have been here and we're at the end of the 2,000 years. Yeah, but you don't know how the Lord counts. Does He count the 400 years that Israel was captive or not? <laughs> I sure hope not. But if He does, everybody in this building is going to die before the rapture takes place. Does he start his count with 2033? Does he start his count at 33 AD when the death of the testator takes place on Calvary? Does he start his two days count there? Well, if that's the case, you'd have to back the tribulation out of that, but you still got a few more years left to go. Did he start it at the birth of Jesus Christ at zero time or 4 BC as Usher and Unger uh, seem to agree on or 3 BC or 2 BC or 1 BC or if he was born when he was born, did he start the two days of the church? Well, the church didn't start at his birth. So does it start at the death of the testator or does it start at 225 days later when they reject Israel, rejects uh, Stephen's preaching in Acts chapter 7 and does it begin after the apostle Paul is given the mystery of the church and then you step the thing, when does the thing, when does he start his count? The church is Jewish all the way up until Paul's called out in Acts 9. Then he spends three years on the backside of the desert before he comes and starts preaching the gospel that nobody even knew anything about. How are you going to figure that out? You say, what happened? The church starts in Acts 2, but the church that starts in Acts 2 is a Jewish church. And in order for you to get in, you had to get in under, Paul, under uh, Peter's preaching, which was still the gospel of the kingdom. You say, why? Paul hadn't even been made aware of the other gospel yet. I don't understand this. I apologize for getting into this dissertation for just a second. How can you say that everybody is saved the same way when Peter preaches differently than Paul preaches? And in Acts 15, Peter says, oh, we believe what Paul does. Death, burial, and resurrection. That's not what Peter preaches in Acts 2. In Acts 2, Peter preaches repent and be baptized. Why? That's the same thing the Lord told him to preach when he called him out in Matthew 10. In Matthew 10, go not to the way of the Gentile or the Samaritan, go only to the lost sheep of the house of what? Israel. And preach the kingdom. That's not the message that you get preached. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul comes along. And you know what he says? Though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you any other gospel than that which we preach, let him be accursed, let him be anathema, let him be damned. Well, wait a minute, Paul. Jesus didn't preach that. Peter didn't preach that. None of the apostles preached that. 
If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you got all the Old Testament prophets preaching a different gospel. They're going to hell unless you change all that and say, well, they all preached Paul's gospel. How could they preach Paul's gospel? It wasn't even known to them until Paul was called out. How could they preach Paul's gospel? So you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, that's, that is kind of strange, you know. But maybe they kind of knew that because you could see the scarlet thread through that. You couldn't see it if you didn't have Paul's glasses on. The Bible even says if they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know who he was. They're expecting a guy to show up on a white horse coming in there, kicking Rome off the throne. Here comes a guy riding in the colt, the foal of an ass. Comes walking into it as a, as on a donkey. That doesn't look like a conqueror. If he's the conqueror, hail the Messiah, hail the Messiah, hail the Messiah, throw the palm leaves down, take off their coats, throw them down there, have him come through there. Boy, he's the Messiah. Three days later, they're hollering, crucify him. Boy, what a fickle bunch of people. <laughs> Independent Baptist Church, I guess. <laughs> like him one day and three days later they can't stand him. And if he's the Messiah, they crucified him. Nobody saw it, not even the Old Testament prophets. He's cut off right there. And then all of a sudden he comes back up and Peter says, that was your Messiah, you crucified him. And Stephen gets up and says, we had Moses and he, boy, rah, rah, rah. And we had Abraham, our father, rah, rah, rah. And he said, and you crucified the Messiah and you're guilty of his death. And now they're going to stone him. Yeah. Stephen's a spiritual fellow there. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know why the Lord's standing up? Because if they accept his preaching right there, you're getting ready to step off into tribulation. And right there, the Lord stops it, steps off in Acts chapter number 8. I'm giving you just a historical review of the Bible. And an Ethiopian eunuch is saved. You say, what was that? Gentile. A black man saved right there. Philip get called out of a great revival meeting over there. And the Lord goes down there and heals uh, or saves the Ethiopian eunuch. And then Philip disappears. Acts chapter 9, Paul gets knocked off of his horse down there in the dirt. And the end of Acts chapter number 9 there, Ananias comes over there and baptizes him. And the scales fall off after the baptism. And he sees and the Lord hauls him off for three years on the backside of the Arabian desert to teach him something. Send him to school. And then brings him out after three years and said, Now, Paul, I want you to go not to the Jew. Now I want you to go to the Gentile. The same way I called apostles to go to the Jew, I want you now to go to the Gentile. And everything changes. And the mystery of the gospel and the mystery of the Jew and Gentile in one body and all those mysteries that are revealed to the apostle Paul that Stephen, I mean that Timothy is supposed to be a steward of those mysteries, all of those things are given to the apostle Paul. You say, well, who knew about them before that? Nobody. That thing is written where if they accept, that whole deal would have moved all the way to the end of the millennium. And if you'd have got in, you'd have got in out there. The way the Lord did that thing was He stopped it right there and then He opened up a thing that would be parenthetical is the best way I know to describe it. He opened up the time of the Gentiles. He opened up the church age. That's what you're in. You're in the parentheses right now. You, uh, you ought to thank God you're in the parentheses. <laughs> You say, why? You're the only group of people that gets it absolutely by grace through faith. Amen. No works to get it. No works to keep it. No works to prove you are. I got it because I believed what he did. Amen. He did it. He finished it. I get wore out with these people nowadays who talk about works, 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 works. That's just a way to keep you coming to church. I believe you ought to come to church. I believe you ought to read your Bible. I believe you ought to pray. All that stuff's in the Bible. But it's not proof of anything. If it is proof of anything, the Catholics and the Charismatics got it on us. Right? <clears throat> Haven't you had times in your Christian life, ladies and gentlemen, where you know you're saved, but you ain't living like you're saved? Amen. You haven't had times like that in your life? You say, what are you? You're human. You say, I'd never be that way. Careful, careful, careful. <laughs> Lord, have been merciful not to bring something in your life that might knock you right off the railroad track, and put you off on the sidecar somewhere. You can't say that definitively. You don't know that. You don't know how many times God has stepped in and kept something from you to keep you from getting out. Amen. So you know what happened? You say, well, Lord, thank you. I am what I am today by the grace of God. Period. End of story. What will I be tomorrow? Well, let's wait till tomorrow to see. <laughs> you make it by the end of the day. You get ready to put your head on the pillow. And you say, well, Lord, I made it through another day. And thank you for helping me get through the day. And I pray you'll help me to sleep tonight. And I'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow. You say, why? You don't know what's going to happen. You might kick off during your sleep during the night. So now you're worrying about things going on the next day and you don't even see the next day. 
You with me so far? Yes. Notice this thing in 2 Timothy talking about the last days. The Apostle Paul comes along here. And again, we're just talking about Christian character. Come all the way down, if you will, please. He says to Timothy in verse number 2, My dearly beloved son, that's not his physical son, that's his son in the Lord. Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with what? Now, I've already been through that thing with a pure conscience. He, I, I gave you all the stuff on a pure conscience and a sealed conscience, seared conscience and a defiled conscience and a wicked conscience and all the other kind of things. But his conscience is speaking to him. And he said, I have a pure conscience that without seasoned, I remember to pray for you night and day. I don't know how you are with your prayer life and praying for other people, but when you get in a desperate situation, there is nothing like hearing your name called out in prayer. There's nothing like hearing somebody pray for you. There's nothing like getting a text or a phone call or an email instead of it being some slop about somebody's personal life and laying out some kind of personal vendetta against somebody or some gossip or slander. It's nice to see we're praying for you. Don't know what's going on, but we're praying for you. I'll tell you now unequivocally and unapologetically, I don't know if we'd have made it through the past year, whether you like us or don't like us or care about us or don't care about us or think it was God's judgment on us and God's judgment on her because she's a micromanager or whatever it might be that she had cancer. But I'm telling you right now, we would not have made it through if it hadn't been for the prayers of the saints of this church Amen. and people praying all around the world. We get that thing sitting over there on Tuesday and I'm telling you because it's personal and they come out and get me out of the room and I'm thinking, been down this road before and we sit down there in the room like that and she said, everything's fine and I'm thinking, yeah, okay, what does that mean, you know? And she said, your scans are clear and everything looks good. We'll see you again in six months. We have to keep you on this and that and the other. And, and the first thing she said, like we used to call in my days an excited utterance, she said, well, there's people all around praying for me. Amen. And the doctor kind of, she goes... Well, yeah, I'm sure that made a difference. <laughs> and Drina, whatever you may think about her, you know what she said? It's made the difference. Amen. That's a pretty bold testimony. I might be like, maybe, you know, don't, don't, you don't have to be... No, she knows where it came from. I know where it came from. A lot of things went on behind the scenes that we didn't make public. It was a bad year this year, a rough time, a hard time. You say, what got us through? Little card coming to mail. Pair of socks comes in the mail, toboggan comes in the mail, scarf comes in the mail, flowers come in the mail, a card, a phone call, a text, a letter, praying for you, 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 praying for you. Cease not to pray night and day. You know, say, why did she make it and somebody else didn't? She had the prayers of the saints. No other reason. We don't give glory to anybody else for that. You say, well, she had a real good oncologist. She did. She had a real good surgeon. She did. There's no guarantee it's not coming back. I know that. I'm aware of that. But right now, yes. right now, she's clear right now. Amen. And things are moving in the right direction right now. You say, why? There's people that she sat in that room with having that WD-40 and that 2,4-D and all that roundup. Stuff. They didn't make it. They're not here. Why is she here? Because she's special? No, because of the prayers of the saints. That's why. Because of you praying. If you wanted her to die, you should have not been praying for her. So I'm, I'm positive of that. Somebody, you know, well, you know why she got cancer. You know, yeah. She's always telling everybody what to do, you know. You know how she is. Okay, well, God bless your heart when you've been at it 30 years <laughs> trying to get stuff done around. You know, that's the way things go sometimes. I'm sorry to be so personal with you. That's how we are sometimes. Somebody gets sick, you immediately think, well, they probably uh, did something wrong. Well, sometimes you know why you get sick. You get sick because you're worried and so burdened about other people that it makes you sick. That's why preachers get sick. You say, oh, well, they ought to grow up, grow a thicker skin. Well, God bless you, you rhinoceri. <laughs> it ain't that way. You say, why? You have emotions. You have emotions. It hurts. You say, why'd she get sick? I don't know. Ask the Lord. I couldn't tell you. But I know she got sick. Right. And I know right now she's well. Amen. And I wouldn't wish it on any one of you to go through whatever she went through. I mean, that, that stuff, man, that was, that, pfft. I mean, it's bad when I'm praying to ask me, Lord, help me to get through the thing. And I'm not even taking the junk to get through the stuff. So preacher, what are you saying? I don't know. That convicted me when I saw that. I cease not to pray. Remember my prayers night and day. I made a commitment when I went back over this to say when I tell somebody I'll pray for them, I got to write it down so I don't forget to pray for them. 
you get a prayer list that goes around here on a regular basis. Now, you may not realize this, and you may not know that years ago we were known as a praying church. I'm talking about going way back over here where people would call us when they didn't know anything else was going on, and they would call us and say, Brother Peacock, could you have your church pray? And we would pray for people we didn't even know. I'm talking about all around the world. You have a prayer list that goes back there right now that gets passed around in here. And some of you make light of that thing, maybe because God hadn't answered prayer for you, or maybe because you don't ever read that thing. But that prayer list goes around, and then Miss Linda takes that thing and types it all out and puts it down, and you'll see stuff on there about people you don't even know. That prayer list is not just for people in here. That prayer list is for people you're connected to. you got a big family. Did you know that? You say, well, preacher, it'll be 10 pages long. Okay, they need prayer. You don't think that when I go other places and I have things going on here, I don't tell other people to pray for you? Sure I do. You say, what? They're your extended family. You know how many pastors you had here during this meeting last week? Pastors, not just preachers, missionaries, pastors. You had 27 pastors. 27 churches were represented here. You say, what does that mean? You're connected to 27 other churches. Yes let alone the ones that are watching online and things like that. I'm talking pastors that came here. You say, what do they do? Man, they have people going through trouble. Preacher, can you put us on your prayer list? That thing goes out and you might wind up with four or five pages. I remember the old story was one day there was a lawyer that walked in. He was representing uh, uh, Brother Lester Roloff down in Texas. And they were having a big deal about getting licensed from the stake to run the home and that kind of a thing. And they're being tried in the courtroom down there. And they go by his motel room and bang on the door. And he doesn't answer and bang on the door again. He finally comes to the door there. And the lawyer said when he walked in, and he said he saw the most unusual thing he'd ever seen. He said he saw the bed there and he said there were pages scattered out four and five abreast there running all the way down the length of that thing like that. And he said, Brother Roloff, are you preparing for court? He said, no, this is my prayer list. Amen. He said, I pray through each one of those things. He said, well, what time do you start? He said, 3.30. Yeah. Wow. He's going to court, he's on trial and he's praying for other people. You say prayer doesn't matter. Well, if it don't matter, it's strange to me that the Lord sure prayed. And if the Lord prays, I guess I better pray. I better learn and work on that. I don't know about you, but there's nothing to get me under conviction quicker than talk about my prayer life. <laughs> you can talk about rock and roll music all day long. I'm good to go. But you talk about my prayer life, man, I'm going to have to be down here at the altar. I remember the, there's an old preacher. His name's Green. He's about gone now. He's getting on the edge of things there. He's an old fellow. He's been. He's way up there in uh, in Michigan, Lansing, uh, Michigan. I met him at a church at Preacher Lackey's meeting there, and I was young back in those days. So Green, I'd have stuck stuck me in the ground. I'd have grown, <clears throat> and I walked up to him because I heard he was a praying man. And I said, Brother Green, he's an old fellow. Even in those days, he's up in his seventies. He's an older fellow there. And I said, Brother Green, I said, I'm uh, David Peacock. I know you don't know me. He says, You that policeman? And I said. Well, yes, sir. I'm the, he said, you preaching policeman. And I said, yes, sir. That, that'd be me. I said, could I ask you a favor? He said, what do you want? Just curt. Not, not rude. Just curt. And I, I had a habit. Uh, Brother Lentz and I both had a habit. We'd get old preachers to pray for us. I mean, put their paws on us and pray for us. We thought, you know, there's something to that. And I said, pray for him. He said, get down. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people walking around in the gymnatorium. And he put his mitt on me like that and he prayed. I don't know what he prayed. He prayed something down there. And he said, okay, man, I prayed for you. I said, all right, well, I sure do appreciate it. I appreciate the prayers. And I left. I ran into him a year later at the same meeting. I walked up and I said, Brother Green, he said, David Peacock. Wow. He said, I pray for you every day. Somewhere on one of my phones that I have, I have a note that his son sent me after he saw me in a meeting. I was up in Detroit. I preached in a meeting up there, and his son was at the meeting. Jim, uh, uh, Jim Green is his name. And Jim came to that meeting. He said, I heard you say something about my dad praying for you. And I said, yeah. I said, and I ran into him the next year. He said, he prayed for you every day. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I saw his name on your list, on his list. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, he has a list with your name on it. He sent me a picture. And he highlighted my name on there, and there's my name going all the way back to the years ago I met him up there, and every day he laid that thing out there, and he laid out a rug down there so he wouldn't get his suit dirty, and he'd lay down there, and he'd go through and pray for every name on that list. You never want to limit anybody praying for anybody. 
Now, every now and then we get some wacko comes through here, you know, I want you to pray for some paintball game or something or another, or, you know, pray against the government or whatever. I'll strike those. I don't have any problem with that. But you have a real need, you take it to the Lord in prayer. Sometimes you put unspoken. You say, you know, maybe you shouldn't put that on. Yeah, put unspoken. You say, why? Sometimes people know what's going on in your life. It's not good to tell them all the details. Sometimes it's very personal. Sometimes it's something that's happening in your family life. Not everybody needs to know about that stuff. You can be a family without knowing everybody's goings and comings. And, and don't get snotty if somebody tells somebody and they don't tell you. You know, well, I already knew about that. Oh, okay, great. Are you praying about that? I got several more. I got to move on here. I got several more uh, illustrations of prayer. But you know what Paul said about his son Timothy there, his son in the Lord? He said, I, with a pure conscience, with a clear conscience, I can tell you, Timothy, eyeball to eyeball, face to face, I pray for you night and day. Night and day. You ever been driving down the road and the Lord lay somebody on your heart? You ever wonder why he lays them on your heart? I'll tell you a quick story. One time, I, Mom Utley called me one morning about 7.30. She doesn't usually call that early. She's getting old now. She can't half hear, and her eyes are going bad. And she's got a new hearing aid, but it, it don't help much. She has to be about this far from you and watch your lips to be able to catch what you're saying. And you have to talk kind of slow and make sure because she, she can't quite grab a hold of that thing. As a matter of fact, she said the other day in a testimony meeting, she, she just raised her hand and she said, when I get where I can't hear and I can't see anymore, could somebody just pick me up and bring me and set me on the front pew and just let me hold my Bible while I'm in church? That was one of my illustrations about the local church. Anyway, about 7.30 in the morning, the phone rings. It doesn't ring at the house that often. It wasn't my cell phone. It was at the house. And I pick up the phone and she said, uh, morning. I said, uh, hey, Mama, what you doing this morning? You up mighty early? She said, no, nope. I just wondered, how are you? I said, oh, we're fine. Everything's going good. We're, we're doing okay. Really, everything's good? She said, I said, yes, ma'am, everything's good. She said, it's funny. She said, Lord woke me up about 4.30 this morning. I said, what you do? She said, I went up on the mountain. That meant she went up on the mountain to pray. Those of you who have been there. She went up on the mountain. That's uh, about 150 yards up the hill there and over on the left-hand side from her house. She said, I went up on the mountain to pray. I said, well, what'd you do that for? She said, well, the Lord woke me up, said you needed me to pray. And, I, and, and then she said something, put me under conviction. She said, I guess he is wrong. <laughs> and then I, man, I cracked, man. I mean, I'm kind of like, we were going through something, man. I'm telling you what, we were having a fare thee well. Boy, it was bad. And no, it wasn't an argument between the two of us. It was a bad deal. And we were going through, man, and our hearts were busted all to pieces and we were bruised and battered and banged up. And I said, well, you know, and I started <laughs> talking to her. She said, well, I knew something was, I knowed something. I knowed something wasn't right up there. That's why she said, I want you to know I'll be praying for you till the, till the storm passes by. Amen. You say, what was it? Lord woke her up at 4.30 in the morning. She's an elderly woman and walk, goes up on the hill and gets in that sawdust up there. And then the call unto me there in the book of Jeremiah. Mine, and I will hear them. And she grabs a hold of that rock and up there at 4.30 in the morning praying up on that mountain. Lord ever wake you up at 4.30 in the morning and say, pray for so-and-so? Do you get up? I bet you would if it was your wife or your kids. You know what Paul said? Every time the Lord tagged me about praying for you, boy, I prayed for you. I even prayed even if the Lord didn't tag me with a pure conscience. You ask somebody to pray for you, can you look at them eyeball to eyeball and say, I'm praying for you? That's a big deal. You say, why? Well, the Lord wouldn't make mention of prayer so much in the Bible if it didn't make a difference. People say, well, God's going to do what He's going to do no matter what. Really, you hadn't read your Bible. A lot of times prayers changed what God was going to do. Yes, yes. A lot of times. Well, yeah, but I know that Passover from Jeremiah where the Lord said, you need and pray. Yeah, but that's after Jeremiah had stood in the gap and given him a bunch of opportunities to get things right. And then the Lord said, because I've called and they wouldn't answer, now I'm not going to hear them. But you needn't worry about that. Don't make that up. You're not a Calvinist, are you? You think the die is already cast and prayer doesn't move the needle? Well, then why pray before you go in for surgery? Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. What if the Lord decides to extend your life? Hezekiah prayed. You say, what happened? He got another 14 years. She said, yeah, but he got a wicked son and all that. Oh, okay, I understand what happened to him, but the Lord extended it. 
You ever notice David praying over there and asked the Lord to forgive him? You ever read it in Psalm 51? You know what the Lord did? The Lord heard his prayer. You think prayer doesn't matter? Let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. Do you pray to get saved? I believe you did. You had to ask him, didn't you? You know what some of the times that you need to do? you got a problem with somebody. you got a problem with your own personal life, your problem with your own physical health and this and that and the other. You know what will help you sometimes? Pray for somebody else's problem. Amen. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised what will happen to your problem. You think, Lord, if I pray for somebody else, maybe they'll pray for me. Yeah. You want me to tell you who to get to pray for you? Old people and kids. Old people have time to sit in that wheelchair or sit there in that bed and look up at the ceiling. They have time to talk with him. They know things about God me and you may not know. Kids, they're innocent. They just walk right into the throne, just, just, just walk in there and say, Lord, you need to do something with this, you know. That's what the old preacher used to say. Get the kids to pray and get the old people to pray. You say, why? They can just walk right in there and get a prayer answered. You need something done? Get the kids to pray. You say, why? It matters. But not only that, it's great for them to see the testimony when their prayers get answered. Don't teach them to pray to Santa Claus. Yeah. Amen. Teach them to pray to God. Yeah. When that thing comes along, Christmas time, I realize I'm fixing to upset you now. Christmas comes along and there's a bicycle under the tree. You know, Santa Claus brought, no, the Lord provided that for you. Yes. And mom and daddy had to work to get it. Oh, you're destroying the child's dreams. Okay. Okay. I, I get it. It's okay to lie under certain circumstances. I get that. Notice what he says, greatly desiring to see thee, verse number four, being mindful of thy what? Tears. No, tears before joy. Tears before joy. Right? Joy comes when? In the morning. Sometimes it's after a long night of tears. The Lord's crying with great sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says that when he finally goes to the Lord three times and asks about the cup to pass, like Paul asked the Lord to pass one of the thorn three times, he gets up and he says, for the joy that was set for him, he endured the cross. He set his face like a flint and endured the cross for the joy. You say, oh, joy comes after the tears. Sometimes it's after heartbreak and after difficulty and things like that. And then notice, if you will, please, in verse number 6, he said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Now, stirring up the gift of God, ladies and gentlemen, is an important thing for you to understand. To stir up is to exert, to exhort, to encourage, uh, to try to prepare it, to, to study uh, you need to learn to give attention to reading. If God gave you a gift, you need to use that gift. Not everybody has the same gift. Come, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians 12. My wife used an illustration, I think, during the supper or the luncheon for the ladies, talking about this uh, grape drink that uh, one of her aunts used to make. And uh, they put, I mean, the reason it tasted so good is it had a little bit of grapes and a whole lot of sugar. But you know as well as I do, anything that's cold, I mean, if you're going to make sweet tea, you've got to put the sugar in it when it's hot, and that way it'll melt the sugar. You don't get that when you're up north. Up north, you better have stevia or something because they'll bring you unsweet tea. You put sugar in that thing, it'll be piled up because you, it, it won't mix. I'm not throwing off on northerners. I'm just saying they don't know how to make sweet tea. I'm just saying. You, you put the sugar in while it's hot, Right? You say, what happens? When he's talking about stirring up, if you don't stir it up, it'll settle to the bottom. Yes. Well, there's a reason you have to be stirred up. You have to understand there's certain things each one of you can do, others can't do. No person can do everything. Right. It requires a multitude of things. Where you get into trouble is when the eye's trying to do what the head's supposed to do and the head's trying to do what the hand's supposed to do and now you get territorial with everything. You get upset. That's mine to do. Uh, okay. Some of you should go to the military for a while and learn some things about a, about a chain of command. Sometimes you grab the control of things because you're a little bit of a control freak. Amen. Good preaching. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter number, I said 2 Corinthians 12. I mean 1 Corinthians 12. Apologize. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. The body is one. Verse 12. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I think so. Look at verse 11 though. All these worketh that one self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as what? As he will? Severally. That's, that's a word for separately. In other words, the Lord's the one giving out the gift in the first place. 
You don't take a gift. God gives you a gift. A gift is not something you choose or pick. It's something that's given to you. If you can understand that when it comes to the ministry, you don't want to do something God didn't gift you to do. Amen. Otherwise, you're out of place. Right. Now notice what the Bible says, verse 12. The body is one, hath many members, and all members of the one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. We're all fitly knit together. Hallelujah. Isn't this great? Isn't it wonderful? How, so, how come so much discord in the church then? Why so many divisions in the church? If we know that that's the fact of the matter, I can tell you why. He goes on to show you in the most carnal church that there was. You say, what did they have envy and strife and division over? Somebody doing what they think they ought to be doing instead of just doing what's before them. It not being done how they want it done. Getting kind of quiet. It's just Sunday school. <laughs> Notice, for by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. That's your spiritual baptism. That's how you get saved. It has nothing to do with water whatsoever, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free. And all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand and I'm not the body, is it therefore not of the body? No, the foot and the hand are both a part of the body. But if the hand says, if I'm not the foot, I don't want to be a part of it, that's the contrast he's making. If I'm not going to be the one I want to be, then I'm not going to be a part of the body. No, you're already baptized into the body. You're already one of us whether you like it or not. <laughs> He's already told you that. You're already in the body. The problem is, is that you don't like your position in the body. Don't be a hemorrhoid in the body of Christ. <laughs> really, you don't need to burn an itch all the time and swell up when you don't get your way. Be whatever God wants you to be. Amen. And be happy being that. Yes, sir. You say, well, I want to be the head. But, but if, you, if, you, if God doesn't want you to be the head, why would you want to be where God doesn't want you to be? If He'd be happy with you being a hand, why don't you just be a hand? Yes, sir. Amen. What are you? I'm a hand. I'm a finger on the hand. Mm -hmm. Well, what is that? Makes God happy. That's all that matters. Yes. Watch what He says. The foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? The answer is that. That's a rhetorical question. He's being sarcastic. You can't say you're not in the body when you know that you are, even though you're a foot and a hand. If the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? The whole body is, uh, were an eye. Where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Now grab the concept. It should be simplistic, but it's not. Here's the thing. The thing says, the hand says, listen, I want to be a foot. The Lord said, you're not equipped to be a foot. You're not made to bear. You don't have the ankle bone. You don't have the things that you need in the foot to give you the proper balance. You don't have the big toe. The thumb is similar to that, but it's not set up the same way. The foot is set up for it to be able to do this. The hand doesn't do the same thing. That's why you walk on your feet, not your hands, not because you're evolved or whatever. But the hand can do things the foot can't do. Yes, well, I want to be the hand. The Lord said, but you'll be out of place trying to be a hand when you're a foot. Right, right. And now you know what will happen. You'll be miserable. Yes. Then you know what happens. You become an ogre when it comes to telling everybody what to do because you're trying to be something that God doesn't want you to be. Right. Why can't you just be what God wants you to be? Right. Well, I don't know. I don't know why he wants me to, do, to be a foot. Because he needs to put a sock and shoe on you. Right. Yes. He's trying to cover you up. I don't, I don't know. 90% of your body is covered right now. You're going to tell me, listen, if you were standing up here with a, like the day you came in, your most vital organs are covered up. Oh, you're not getting it. Yeah. Can you see your heart? No, you can't. Can't live without it. Can you see your lungs? No, you can't. Can't live without them. Can you see your liver? No, you can't. Can't live without them. You sure appreciate having a stomach. Can't live without it, right? You can't see the other parts that go on on the inside there, the pericardium and all the other kind of things. You don't see all that stuff. Most of it's covered up. Mm -hmm. Most of the important stuff is covered. Yes. Yes. I don't know why it is we're always looking to be seen. Right. The Lord's like, don't you get the picture? The picture is, is that that's not the most comely thing. The most beautiful thing are the things that you need the most. Not just your face. And the Lord gives you an, inst an instruction here. He said, why can't you just be what I want you to be? Because it makes me, I put you there, verse 11, the way it makes me happy. Right. See, it's not how you're getting recognition or, 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 or appreciation for, you know, I finally am doing this. And the Lord's like, yeah, but you're doing something I didn't want you to do. I didn't ask for you to do that. People have all kinds of ways of getting attention. 
Amen. Good preaching. Notice what he says. But notice, now God hath set, verse 18, the members of one of them in the body, uh-oh, as it what? I have a whole note here. I'll probably have to cover it tonight. But that covers the idea that if God puts you in a ministry, then do it. But if He doesn't, don't. Amen. You say, why? You may not have anybody to help you. Right. Well, I just think everybody ought to be doing Everybody's not called to do the same thing. Every one of you is not a street preacher. Yes. Every one of you in here doesn't work at a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Everybody in here don't go to the hospitals. My friend, Brother Lentz, and I love him to death. He's a good street preacher and stuff like that. I asked him several times back in the day to go to the nursing home and stuff. He said, I can't handle it. I, don't, I can't go to the nursing home. I can make myself do it. After all the things you've seen, Jim, and all the places you've been and the stuff you saw in Quezon and Vietnam and so on and so forth, he said, can't stand nursing homes, brother. Can't stand it. I can't stand it. He said, I don't even like to be in hospitals. You talk about tough as nails, he's tough as nails, but there's just, he said, ain't my calling, man, I ain't going there. They asked us one time to go to a particular place and to try to set up some things at a Bible school. Jim said, I ain't called there, and I ain't going. He said, well, but they need you over there. He said, if the Lord tells me to go, I'll go. Now, this is hard for some of you, because what you have to learn to do is, is the Bible says God puts you where it pleased Him. So if you're riding a pew and that's pleasing God, then ride the pew. You're not proving anything by stretching out if God didn't tell you to stretch out. Yes. But watch it. If that's what God's called you to do, be careful about talking about the people that are doing while you're riding. Amen. I don't know why everybody's so busy. I, why is it bothering you? You're doing what God wants you to do? Then do what God told you to do and don't worry about it. That's so what God called me to do. Good, great. I'm glad you're here. I don't like we got a dozen sick people out today. You say, why? I like church house being full. Yes. I mean, I like it to be packed out. I like it when everybody's here. You say, well, I, you know, I don't really, I don't think it's that big of a deal. It may not be to you. It matters to me. Right. You want to be a pew rider? Ride the pew, man. I don't care. Ride it all day long. But you got to watch it. Because that guilt monkey will get on you and you'll see somebody. Listen, God called you to be a mama. Be a mama. You hear me? God called you to homeschool your kids, then homeschool your kids. But don't you try to pass that off on everybody else because I got news for you. Some of you women are not given to homeschool. I don't care what preacher tries to tell you, every woman ought to be given to homeschool and just trust God to do it. You're going to raise a stinking infidel is what you're going to do. I would rather... Oh boy, I'm on a good spot right here. I'm going to camp out for just a minute. When you stink and get sick, you want to go to a doctor that's been properly trained. Is that true? Yes. Now, why would you think that it's bad to send your kid to a teacher who knows how to teach right. Right. instead of you taking up the mantle yourself out of your stubbornness and rebellion or maybe laziness and say, get up in the morning, keep your jams on, eat your Frosted Flakes and mini wheats and sit down and watch the TV. And, you, and you, you're homeschooling. You ain't homeschooling. The TV is. Right. Right. And then you raise a hothouse plant. And then the kid comes out and they're scared of people and they've never been around people and they never had, you know, somebody bully them, somebody shove them. That's part of school, yes. learning to get along with people. Yes. Amen. Amen. I never thought that'd be a point, <laughs> but it's a point. Yes, yeah, why you get, you got no business experience. You say, why? Everybody doesn't buy from you. That's Wally World. You get out there and you get, I don't know how many no's before you get a Yes. You have to be trained. It's odd how people put spirituality on that. I know some women. They've tried to homeschool. They about blew their brains out. <laughs> Time that kid gets about six years of age, you're like, man, somebody must be trained to handle these kids better than me. I can't handle this. And they cannot wait to kick that door. Get out! Get out! Go to school right now. Police will put you in jail if you don't go to school. And then they get home, they're like, oh, man, this is utopia. <laughs> If you've had that kid with you for six years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're about ready for a break, aren't you? God help you. God bless you if you can handle it. But sometimes it's better to turn it over to the professional. Let the pros handle it. And you say, well, you know, Christian school, they ain't always the best. Private school, it's not always the best. But you might be able to find somebody that might be able to help you if you're not able to do it. Now, some of you can handle it, and you're better at it than the regular teachers. Good. But listen to me, and I'm done for Sunday school. 
Don't you ever think because you can do it that it's what everybody else ought to be doing. And just because baking soda worked for you doesn't mean that somebody else that does chemo and radiation doesn't mean they're out of the will of God and didn't trust God. It means you do what works for you. Wing of bat and eye of newt and, you know, baking soda and peroxide. and Okay, good. Praise the Lord. Glad it worked for you. Some people get led in a different direction. Don't make that spiritual. Well, I'll tell you what I'd do, preacher. Okay. Well, when it happens to your wife, come talk to me. But in the meantime, I'm scheduling an appointment with a surgeon. You say, well, I want that junk out. And this is what we're going to do. You say, what? I'm listening to experts. Now listen to the analogy. With education, you better pay attention because you're setting that kid on a, a, a case to either succeed or fail. Equip them so that they have the best chance to succeed. And it's not all Bible. I hate to tell you that. And I know I can't, I don't have time to finish it. You're thinking I'm an apostate right now. It is not all Bible. When they get out there and the, they don't care, I can quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. They're like, great. Do you know math? Do you know science? Do you know English? Well, no, but I was, I was raised in a Bible-believing home. Good. And you out having a job. And then, you know, well, the world's wicked and the world won't hire me because you don't know how to turn wrenches. Do you don't know how to use a shovel. Yes. Do you understand? I'm pretty passionate about it. I get wore out with that. You say, why? I get that a lot of places where I go. How do you feel about homeschooling? I said, same way I do about education. How's that? Sometimes you got to rely on experts. I guess it will depend on the quality of the teacher. Yes. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying, you want to teach them? Look at the mama and think to yourself, do you want another one like that? Because <laughs> it'll be the mom doing the teaching. It won't be the dad. And mom's over here about half bald, tearing her hair out of her head and grinding her teeth and banging her head. She's over there banging her head on the desk and thinking, I can't handle this. And you come in, hey, baby, how you doing? Had a good day today? I'm going to kill somebody, you know. Great educational atmosphere. <laughs> and then you look at the kids and they've colored all over the walls. And they're like, honey, what are you doing? Can't you control these kids? Yeah. yeah, you get grits for breakfast and grits for breakfast. I mean, for lunch and grits for dinner too. <laughs> all right, we'll take a break there and hope you'll come back for the morning service. Father, bless your word and thank you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.